Welcome to Wrestling With Heart, a podcast looking at pro wrestlers giving back to their community. Join me, Stanley Carr, as I interview wrestling's hottest names who use their platforms as entertainers to raise awareness and do community service. Hello, and welcome to another edition of Wrestling With Heart. This is the show where we talk with professional wrestlers about their careers in and out of the ring, as well as doing acts of community service and charity work, inspiring others. That's all, you know, we're all about the positive positivity here on the show. And I've got a very special guest with me today. He is um, one of the uh, great wrestlers to wrestle in the independent circuit here in Nashville. He's also an actor and podcaster. Uh, has also made some appearances for the WWE, and we'll talk about that as well on the show. I'm pleased to welcome Flynn Hendricks. Flynn, welcome to Wrestling With Heart. Oh, man, thank you for having me. Thank you so much. I've been looking forward to this since we booked it. Yeah. Awesome. My pleasure. So you're also from Nashville. We're taping this uh, yep. here in Nashville, Tennessee. Tell me about your upbringing. Oh, man. So born and raised here, which these days seems like it's a very, very rare, or unique thing. I never thought that would, you know, I never thought that'd be something that we'd be dealing with in this day and age. But born and raised here, I'm actually back living in the neighborhood that I was uh, raised in. But you know, I grew up with my godmother and godfather uh, and my grandmother on my mom's side. They were the biggest influences in the picture. Uh, my dad was there but didn't want to be. Um, so kind of kind of non-existent. So I had my godfather as a father figure to look, you know, to look up to. And my mom, uh, essentially, even though dad was there, was basically like a single mom situation for me and my sister. Mm -hmm. And did did the best she could. Thankfully, we had my grandmother and godparents there to help because if it wasn't for them, we would have been SOL. But, you know, that's kind of where it all started. Um, you know, there were some struggles at certain times, but we never went without. And it seemed like if it got down to that low point, the godparents or my grandmother were there to uh, to sweep in and save us. And, you know, this to this day, I still live close to my godparents. And now my, my kids get to spend time with them just like I did growing up. So it's a it's a real cool thing, and it's kind of, you know, letting them get more of those memories and experiences with my godparents that I didn't get because of, you know, the situation with my dad. So yeah. it's uh, it's kind of come full circle and given me a chance to give them some experiences that I didn't have. So it's kind of a, a win as a parent in my book. But yeah, that's kind of where everything started for me childhood-wise. Yeah, it's it seemed like it kind of it was rough, you know. It's not easy, you know, having a single parent, you know. But right. thankfully, you know, you had you know, your grandparents came through and they're, they're kind of, you know, it's the circle of life now, as they say, you know, the next generation. Yep. Uh, so, wow. That's amazing. Really is. It's good to see that. For sure. Yeah. All right. So, you know, what got you into professional wrestling? And so it's funny because my first memories of pro wrestling kind of come up it was like 1998 and my godfather was really big into it at that time and i just remember being at, at their house and i think stone cold steve austin versus the undertaker was on and then at another time it was that this is your life rock segment with mick foley and you know the rock dwayne johnson whatever you want to call him i remember those two things but it was never enough to you know pull me into it but you know come 2000 we go to uh vacation down at daytona beach my mom's a big wrestling fan and come to find out bash at the beach, the infamous one with the Hulk Hogan situations going on there. Yeah, with Vince Russo. We go to that. Yep. We go to that. I'm still not a fan. I didn't even remember being at that event until I found the ticket stub and, you know, being a big nerd about wrestling that I am now. I'm like, I was there and I don't even remember that happening. I just remember two guys like two rows back behind us getting drunk and getting in a fight and getting escorted out. That's the only thing I remember from that. But flash forward again to 2002 all my friends in middle school were getting into it they're getting together to watch it but i can't uh it's gonna be the royal rumble where triple h made his comeback and he ended up winning but couldn't watch that one but i'm like man okay if they're all doing it i don't want to be left out so i started watching starts the build up to the rock and hulk hogan i get to see my first wrestlemania and it's just like okay i'm hooked two months later judgment day is coming to nashville main event is uh the Undertaker and Hulk Hogan for the WWE Undisputed title. 
you know, getting to see that live, like, man, it was just hook, line, and sinker on top of everything else that went on on that pay-per-view. And, you know, from there, come to find out, I've got a cousin down in Memphis who is close with Coco Beware. And I knew a little bit about Memphis wrestling at that time, a little bit about early WWF, but didn't know that much about Coco. But we were in Memphis, and she offered to introduce us. So, you know, we, we met him, and... I was kind of shocked because he's at the time he was barely taller than me. I was maybe 15 and about five, four at that point. I'm like, hang on. And so I, I started asking him like, it, how do I get into this? Because I, the wheels never crossed like, Hey, this is something you could do outside of, you know, just playing in the basement with your friends and hoping nobody got hurt. But, you know, it's like, well, you know, if you finish college, which I'll, I'm going to go ahead and be honest right now for a professional wrestler to say, if you finish college and get a degree, I will train you. That is an absolute rare thing. So we mm -hmm. made that agreement. We kept in touch. Uh, we actually had me on the phone with Kevin Lawler, one of Jerry Lawler's sons, but uh, kept him up to date when I graduated high school. And then, you know, anyway, a couple of weeks after that was WrestleMania 21. And I'm sitting there watching with my friends. Everything on the card looks awesome. But the one thing that jumped out that entire night was Shawn Michaels versus Kurt Angle which became like my number match. one absolutely my number one Great match of all time and I'm like okay I really want to do this I don't know what it is and I, I didn't know at that time I think I do now but it, I probably don't have a full grasp of it still but I'm like I want to do this I want to follow this goal and if I if there's a guy like Coco that can do it and he's willing to train me okay I'm going to start setting aside money for wrestling school so I started doing that and then come to find out there was a guy at my high school who was a year younger than me, uh, who knew a friend of a friend type of situation. He was actually wrestling at a local promotion that was going on at the time here in Nashville called USWO. And it was run by another Memphis wrestler named Tony Falk, who people may know if they watch Memphis wrestling as the guy that had, I think the rocks first match. He had one of Kurt Angle's first matches. He was the referee for Stone Cold Steve Austin's first match. Did all this stuff. So he was telling me about it. And at the time, he had a trainer named Chris Michaels, who has been interwined in my story for the entire almost 16 years now. But he was running Tony's training school at the time. So I reached out to Coco and said, hey, this is 10 minutes from my house. Uh, would you mind if I started you know, training here to get the basics and still go to college and everything. I was coming back from Chattanooga every weekend. And he gave his blessing because it was Tony. Well, Tony and Chris had a falling out. So Tony and his son LT ran the training school. And man, like it was an eye-opening experience. Just like, cause I'm like, I have to do, I have to do a flip. Like how do I, I've never done a flip. So like, you know, it's like this eye-opening experience as a 140 pound kid that I just, I, I didn't know, but like, after I took my first bump, it, it's the old cliche. It's like, man, I, I want more of this. And I, I didn't know how to say it. My family thought I was insane, but it's just like, I want more of this. I see them do it on TV. Now I want to have my chance at it. And it's just like getting into learn the basics, learn the fundamentals, learn psychology, which was a huge thing. Like it just made me that much more of a fan and I, I could not get enough of it. No, and that I mean, was back in that goes back to 2007 when everything first started. Wow, what a fascinating journey! Yeah, I mean, that basically was like the whole ruthless aggression era, yep, period of time. I mean, a lot of people, you know, we talk about the attitude era being like one of the most mm -hmm. iconic eras and legendary eras of all of wrestling, even the 80s, you know, with the, yep. with the Hulk Hogan. Uh, but the ruthless aggression era kind of gets slept on a bit, and it does. It and I feel, does. And, and and that's kind of the era I grew up in too. When I started, you know, I I started watching the Attitude Era, but like mm -hmm. when I was a kid, I feel like my best memories when I started going to shows was during the ruthless aggression era with yeah. you know Angle and Eddie and and oh, uh, best the absolute best. Yeah, I just you know what? Why do you think that era gets slept on? In your opinion. In all honesty, I think it's because it was a, a changing of the guard, so to speak, because, you know, Steve Austin was on his way out. The Rock was on his way out. You still had guys like Triple H and Billy Gunn and The Undertaker and Kane that were still there. But you have all these new guys that 
sometimes felt like they were being force fed to people like a John Cena, for example. And then you had other guys like Eddie Guerrero or Chris Benoit who were having these killer matches during that time, but weren't necessarily like these huge bodybuilder guys that we come to know as professional wrestlers and sometimes weren't always presented as main event players getting the spotlight now. And it's just like, I think the focus became more on wrestling a lot of the time than storytelling, but there was still a lot of good storytelling there if you actually sat and watched it. Right. But I think it's just because it's kind of like that odd period of changing of the guard where so many people were going out the controversy with Steve Austin happened. And then, you know, then uh, there's other stuff that happened, you know, unfortunately, like the Benoit tragedy, the mm-hmm. love triangle with Matt Hardy, Edge, and Leo. Like, you maybe remember more of the drama than you do the actual matches or storytelling. But a lot of these guys came into their own during that time, like Edge or Eddie Guerrero or whoever you want to say, and actually got to be champion. And, you know, like, it was an awesome time to be a fan because, again, in my mind, it's a guy that was similar to my height that is leading the world like the world's biggest wrestling company he's the number one guy like that that's a hopeful thing for me and i invested in the characters i invested in the story like the background of eddie's overcoming addiction now he's got to overcome this next obstacle of brock lesnar you know it's like it's just basic storytelling that to me got me uh invested emotionally and i it was like can't miss tv if i can't see it now i've got it on recording on a vhs exactly i'm gonna stay up late and watch it you know just i couldn't get enough and i was just invested in the story and i think another thing that kind of helped too uh was the brand split yes no and they still have it today albeit kind of you know in a different format wishy-washy format but um when they set up that first brand split it was like two different companies. Yep. You know, you had Raw, you had SmackDown, you had people that I feel like if you had one show and you had so many guys on there, I don't think you would have had such a successful yeah. roster and people wouldn't have, you know, not a lot of stars would have been made. Right. So I think the the whole concept of the brand split, I think helped a lot it in terms of de- developing stars. And, I, and definitely something I feel like that should be, you know, in use today as well. Absolutely. And I mean, it, it gives more guys and more girls a chance to shine that weren't getting that time, especially during the Attitude Era when you had the same people jumping from show to show. But I mean, of course, if they were drawing the ratings, why wouldn't you? But at the same time, you've got to continue this storyline for your, you know, storyline A, storyline B, these things that are drawing money. But these people that are mid-card or a little bit lower trying to get their get their chance in the spotlight are kind of just pushed to the side to further those stories. So this right. was that opportunity, like the SmackDown 6 that we we hear so much about these days. You know, it's like, here's your opportunity because of this brand split. Go out there and do what you do best. Right, right. And, you know, like you said, you know, it gave those people a platform. And, you know, you start watching it. Were, who, like, were some of the guys, like, you were influenced by in your work? Oh, man. Okay, so number one uh, will always be Shawn Michaels. Like, I remember... The NWO comeback, I remember the SummerSlam match with Triple H and just like, like, you know, learning later, okay, he was still messing around in the ring at his training school, like, oh my God, like this guy is the ultimate showman. He's not the biggest guy, but he can make it look believable when he's in there with a guy like an Undertaker or Triple H or whoever it may be, or Batista, like no matter who it was, he looked like he belonged there. He looked like if he punched him, it made sense, like it was real, but for me he was he's always number one um and i've actually got some gear being made now that's kind of taking my love of anime and then based off some of his gear as well uh but it trunks i'm not gonna wear the long tights again i don't think i think i'm too short for that but you know it's just like the showmanship the the personality and his promos his talking just his character everything about that brought me in but then you know you also have a guy like eddie guerrero like oh my god this guy was the you might as well call him Charisma Unlimited. He had the it factor in spades, and you don't even know what the it factor is, but he could flip a switch from being this energetic, lovable, babyface uh, good guy to, like, when he turned on Rey Mysterio, the ultimate villain that just made you, like, man, I don't know what he's doing, but I, it makes you uncomfortable because of some of the stuff he's saying, mm-hmm. and you can see that he believes in it, man. It's just, like... right. Those two are probably my two best, um, 
like character wise and then well rounded as a whole. But then I'm a big fan of guys like William Regal and Fit Finley because they're more of that technical style, that rounded brawling, down. yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And those are two guys still that I wish could have gotten that run as a as a world heavyweight champion. But you know, like Fit Finley, for example, man, like everything he does looks believable. But then he can still go out there and have a you know um, a short person like Hornswoggle with him and give you a little bit of a comedy act. But then flip the switch right again and go right back to have a match with the Undertaker. Like yeah, those those four guys during that time were probably my biggest uh, my biggest ones that like ended up being influences on my career before I got back into like the old school eighties and AWA stuff. Mm-hmm. But then just as a fan, man, I was always like big on Kane, big on the Undertaker, big on Batista. These big guys that. Just like, you know, they pass the, the airport test. You see them, you're going to stop and look. And, yeah. like, it was just it was just incredible stuff. And, then of course, Brock Lesnar, seeing him manhandle the big show, that was just like, oh, my God, what can't this guy do? He's a freak of nature. But, you know, it's like guys like that that just made me want to watch and then see what they're going to do next. Like, I just – I yeah. loved all that. It was must-see TV. I mean – yeah, where can, where else can you find a two hundred and ninety five pound guy uh, suplex a five hundred pound giant off the top rope and the ring implodes? Exactly, it explodes thing, out of nowhere. The thing that's that's uh, insane about it too is even if that five hundred pound guy didn't want to do it, the two hundred ninety five pound guy could legitimately throw him whether he wanted to go or not. Right. So I mean, it's exactly stuff like that. Like, how does this guy not kill somebody when he's in there? Like, that's insane. It's magic. It is. It it's really magic. Is. You kind of alluded to earlier, you know, you getting started in the wrestling business. Um, tell me about like the training process. How rigorous was it for you? So it was, uh, I'm trying to think, I was a bit of a slow learner at the beginning because, you know, it's a lot of like getting the footwork down. And, you know, at the time I had marching band experience. So there was footwork involved there, coordination, but it's a completely different story. And then, you know, like getting used to these different types of roles or taking flip bumps, back bumps, whatever it may be, um, learning drills to, you know, like hip toss, arm drag, body slam, go to the corner, you know, like just taking these different things. It ended up being sometimes twice a week, sometimes weekly on the weekends. I would be coming back on the weekends during my first semester at college. And, you know, it was just a lot of getting used to that while also probably being the smallest guy in there at the time, because I was five, seven, 140 pounds. Mm. And, you know, it was just like, there was a 300 pound guy in there, a couple guys over 200 pounds. And, you know, like some of these guys ended up, you know, graduating with me, a couple of them faded out and didn't make it to the finish line. But, you know, it's just like, okay, I've got to get used to this. I'm going to go home sore. I'm going to go home, uh, you know, exhausted because you're running these ropes doing the rope drills and everything and you know it just you have to be mentally tough and physically tough because you build up a callus to it and it's just it, it's a unique thing to put your body through and then especially too if you end up taking time off whether you need to or whether you're doing it you know you need to for an injury or you're doing it for uh giving yourself a break when you come back you're gonna have to go, go through that whole process again and you just have to build your body up to that and it's It's not a smart thing to do, if we're going to be honest, but, you know, thank God we have chiropractors these days or we have sports therapists because they, they will help you feel like a brand new person again, but you're literally taking these bumps and it's the equivalent of a 25 mile or 30 mile an hour car crash. So you just have to build that up and being smaller, it takes a little bit more of an impact too, just like it would a big guy, but eventually it gets to the point where you just bump and go, bump and go, do a roll and you're not even thinking about it and but you know the next day or two days later it catches up to you it's amazing to see you know a lot of the smaller athletes uh how they're able to move around and they're able to you know they're so athletic like you know right. a Rey Mysterio or a Sami Zayn or a Ricochet they're able to oh, yes. they're able to you know get around and they're able to do all these high flying maneuvers and you know they have years upon years of experience mm-hmm. and it's it's pretty fascinating fascinating to see you know the the way they don't really have as much wear or tear on their bodies or if they do they're they're not they have a good way of 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 hiding it 
Right. You know? I know there was a period there where like Rey Mysterio, it seemed like every other time he was getting hurt or, you know, like just this, you know, a few months ago at the end of last year, he had, I think, torn, like torn a ligament in his ankle or broken his foot or something. It seemed like it was all catching up to him, but mm-hmm. thankfully he's in a spot now where he's just moving and moving and we've progressed in sports medicine to take care of ourselves yeah. too. So, you know, it's, but like you said, it's insane how some of these guys have gone through all this, done all this and, they're still kicking like brand new. That's, I mean, that's a testament to how well they take care of themselves. Sure. I, I think the medical teams have improved and not oh, just in pro sure. wrestling, but across the board in sports. So hats Absolutely. off to them you know, mm-hmm. for being able to do that. So going in, you made your debut. Uh, tell me about some of your, your first few matches and some of the opponents you've worked with. Oh man. So my first match was actually a fatal four way eliminate. Well, no, it was supposed to be an elimination type match, but it ended up just being a regular fatal four way. It was uh, myself, a guy named J.C. Crow, Derek Neal, and LT Falk. Well, my first match in, LT hits me with a, I think it was like a burning hammer type of move. It was a reverse fireman's carry into a DDT, and Tony had just lost the good ring that he had that we've been training in, and he gone back to this boxing ring which was legitimately plywood and carpet and everything else i'd taken this move tons of times in practice uh you know in that old ring get into this one and first match i get dropped i hit my head right on a you know carpet and plywood slat and like i'm hearing what's going on but i didn't kick out of the move like so my first match i i I don't want to say i blew the finish but it didn't it ended up not making sense for me to kick out anyway, but did that. Then I ended up having a rematch with LT two weeks later. And then it just kind of went from hopping around to various like six man tags or being tied with another trainee before I eventually got to start working with, you know, more experienced people like a Richard Lowe or a Derek Neal or whoever it may be. But, you know, during that time too, guys like Tracy Smothers were coming in and, you know, working with us on Sundays and, that was just an absolute like learning experience in itself because for whatever magical reason, like Tracy always remembered me from that. If we were ever on a show, he would stop and talk to me or, you know, whatever it was, but like, he was just so good at teaching people these things. And like, it was just like, I didn't realize at the time how great of an opportunity it actually was, but man, like just in the beginning, getting that kind of knowledge and learning kid cash would pop in here and there. And, you know, just like, rates. oh yeah, absolutely. And he, he came back later in my career too. That man is a, a drill sergeant and a half, but mm. you know, it's like just getting these opportunities, especially with a guy like Cash, who I was a huge fan of, you know, it's like, wow. Okay. This is, man, I, I would not have guessed I'd get this kind of knowledge or be able to see it from this perspective. And it ended up helping me get a better grasp of psychology whether I realized it at the time or not, because it helped me start putting these pieces together for a more logical and common sense way to structure a match instead of just trying to go and do move, 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 and the audience not even know half of what's going on. It seems like it takes a while to put a match together. Like you have to get the right things in place so that right. you know your dance partner knows what you're doing and they know, you know, you know what they're doing. Hopefully. So yeah, I mean- Injuries can happen, accidents can happen, but you kind of have to move forward. It's it's like improv yep. essentially. So yes, it is. It's no, it's not ballet, not at all, not at all. And and funny you mentioned improv too, because uh, when I I took some time off, I'm skipping ahead a little bit. When I took some time off to actually start studying improv, you know, like of course there's another professional wrestler, an up and coming one in my improv group. But you know, the instructor, uh, his name is Jonathan Pitts. He goes. Well, if you've been doing that, then you should take to this. And lo and behold, he was right. You know, it's like you've been doing this for X amount of years. Now you're just doing it in a different field with less revealing clothing, by the way. But, you know, you're you're taking to it. And it ended up helping me uh, coming back too. I mean, it's literally adapting on the fly, like you said, because somebody could get hurt. That's happened. Somebody could get a concussion and not know what's going on you know, somebody may not be able to do their finishing move and you've got to find another way to get around that. You know, just there's so many different things that you have to be able to work yeah. around on the fly if it happens. And you, it just, it's a matter of being in the moment and knowing knowing what you're doing more than anything. 
There's a story I remember uh, reading an interview with Chris Jericho talking about, you know, when he left WWE the first time, uh, mm -hmm. I believe it was in 05 after his feud with Cena. Yeah. Um, he took some time off, and I think during his break, he did some acting yep. and some improv with the Groundlings, the comedy troupe. So mm -hmm. I think one thing that he had, you know, when he came back was, you know, he had that experience of being able to adapt on the fly in case, you know, something was Absolutely. wrong or just like in a, or, or just like in a, in a skit, you know, backstage, you know, oh, yeah. those little things, they help you get better. So it's, it's, it's important. Like when you take those breaks, when you go do something else and then come back, you, you come back with perspective, a new perspective. Absolutely. And that's, that's another thing too, that it, it ended up teaching me how to take it to the next level on. But when you're performing, um, I always heard that if you don't believe in what you're doing, the crowd is not going to believe in what you're doing. And that's 100% true. They can pick up on it through body language, facials, whatever it may be. And acting helped me take it to a completely different level because, you know, you may be handed a script or you may be given a promo with some bullet points that are written in a way that's not how I would say it or how you would say it. But if you know how to improv that to get the same point across to where you believe in it, it makes a world of difference. And they're going to believe in everything that you're saying at that point. So, I mean, it's just it helps you take it to that next level, because in a sense, this is an act because it's like theater, but with physicality and, you know, a lot more drama. But you still have to be able to commit and believe to it because you are playing a character, even if it's an extension of yourself. Were you before you got into wrestling did you do theater in school were you I, acting i did do that and i also did band but after a certain point band uh kind of became like pretty much all your life was at that point because of marching band sure. concert band and everything but i mean i still i'm quiet in class but i would not be afraid to embarrass myself to make people laugh or make my friends laugh or say something everybody else was thinking when I probably shouldn't have. So, I mean, I was always willing to entertain people. So it was always kind of there, but, you know, having that, and then even the music background definitely helped a lot with, you know, like timing and mm -hmm. Rhythm, all these yes. different things too. Like it's, it's crazy how it all just kind of blends together. Yeah. I mean, definitely it, it all merges into one. For sure. Were there like, were there like any productions that you did that you were fond of doing? Ah, uh, man, not really. Um, I, I know my first one that I can specifically remember was in kindergarten. But I mean, like every year through, uh, I think, ninth grade, I was doing whatever I could with theater and drama and just whether it was like an extra role or some kind of leading role, whatever it was, I, I was trying to do it, even if it was after school or, you know, whatever else, staying until six o'clock, which as a kid, you wouldn't think would be fun, but right. you need to do that. And it's just, it's just a chance to escape reality for a little bit. Sure. And that's something, you know, you took with you to wrestling. And I believe here, um, you, you also did some acting outside of, you know, when you took your break too. Absolutely. Yeah. That's kind of when I jumped in hot and heavy. Um, it was an unintentional break. Uh, we'd actually just found out my wife and I, that we were pregnant with our second child, but I was planning on renewing my Kentucky license. It just, it never happened. The bookings and the company I was working for kind of fizzled out, but I found out, you know, one of my neighbors does voiceover and then lo and behold, you know, our phones listen to us. What pops up on my, uh, you know, on my Facebook timeline is an ad for how to get it, become a voice actor, how to get into voice acting with a guy that I'll actually be um, a guest at a convention with here in a couple weeks in Lebanon uh, named Steve Bloom. You might know him as Wolverine, Spike Spiegel from Cowboy Bebop, whatever it may be. And, you know, it was just a, a master class on how to get into that. So I kind of realized I'm missing my adrenaline rush of performing. This is another way to do it and a way to play different characters. So learned right out of the bat that it's not about the voice you make. It's about how you act, how you perform. And, you know, started doing that it's a very tedious game because you could do everything right, but you may not be the person that gets picked for this role, or you may not do this, but you also have to remind yourself that just because you didn't get it doesn't mean you're bad. And that was uh, another hard thing to learn because I'm a perfectionist, which 
is not something I recommend by any means, but you know, it just, it, it drives you crazy breaking those habits that you've had so ingrained in you for so long, sure. but you know, like getting to book roles, getting to do some things for like a Christmas cartoon that's supposed to be coming out this year for kids mm. and just learning these different dialects, learning these different characters and all these different things and working with these legendary actors that are now directors in Hollywood that, you know, like Charlie Adler, whoever you want to name, like getting to work with them that were these big parts of my childhood and getting to bring this outlandish, you know, like over the top performance because I learned it from wrestling to, you know, like these reads and everything is just absolutely insane to get to do because I was always told, oh, wrestling's not going to help you here. But lo and behold, it helped me out more than I ever thought it would. Yeah. I tried to distance myself from it. It, mm. it failed miserably. Yeah, you know, when you think about wrestlers that cross over to Hollywood, I mean, The Rock is like the epicenter of out. that. And even he, and even there was a period of time where he kind of distanced himself from it. And then yep. a few years later, he comes back. And I act, I would say, you know, his career, I feel like is much stronger now, one could argue, because Absolutely. he realigned, realigned himself back with the wrestling. And he, now he's owning Absolutely. the XFL. He's got all these, you know, blockbuster hits that have come out in the last decade now. So I feel like his uh, big comeback against John Cena, I think, kind of kicked all that off. And oh it's, yeah, I, it's just skyrocketed. Yep, it's it's just it's the authentic remembering where you came from, mm -hmm. and it's it's crazy. Like because it all goes together. Obviously, you don't want to be known as a one dimensional one dimensional wrestler, but I mean, it, it's so cool when it all comes together and you're known for all these different things now. Mm -hmm. It is crazy. Um, you know, Cena's now you know, in that yep. spot where he, you know, he's in the fast and the furious movies. It's crazy to see how like all these people, you know, you got the Bella twins doing their thing. Yep. Uh, amazing to see, you know, the Absolutely. growth of wrestling and how I feel like it's taken a little bit more seriously now in Hollywood. So oh, it's, yeah. it's, it's, I think even Jericho called it a show business boot camp. Is it, it prepares you for all these different different things. It definitely does. And I, I can say it from experience being on set too. You know, in wrestling, it's a one take type of thing. That's what we're used to because we can't go out and redo a promo in front of a live crowd. So, you know, it's like we try to do it right the first time, not thinking that there may be all these other different angles they have to get it from or this or that. So, you know, it's like it prepares you, but you know, again, there's all these other things. It's a lot of hurry up and wait, hurry up and wait that you have to get used to, yeah. but it, it definitely helps with, you know, delivering lines as a character or, you know, getting a little bit physical or getting into a physical stance before they swap you out with a stunt double, whatever it may be. But, you know, it definitely, definitely prepares you and boot camp is probably the best way to say yeah. it. Yeah. Seems like you've got, you know, you've built up that experience over time and you've also got a podcast too that's it yeah tell me about tell me about that man so again it all kind of started during during the pandemic when i was still you know like breaking my way into acting which man it's barely been three years since all this kind of started so it's still i have to remind myself that it's still that fresh into it but i i know all these people whether it's wrestlers or actors whoever it may be that Maybe people know them, maybe they don't, but they definitely should. And I just started thinking about it because I know a lot of creative type people deal with the perfectionist bug, deal with, you know, being your own worst critic, anxiety, and it all kind of comes together. And my thought was, you know, like, what if I had a platform to talk to these people and get their stories out there, make people know who they are? And, you know, I literally within two days of creating it had 50 people that wanted to come on as guests. And it's like, Oh God. Okay. I got to find a way to, to do this now. Yeah. And I was trying to, you know, get some of my teachers who ended up coming on as well, like Sonny straight, Elise Bowman, whoever it may be. And, you know, just booking these interviews and talking to them about how they got started, uh, you know, their mental health or some of my friends like that started her own tattoo shop or, being a teacher during the pandemic, I've had one of my friends on talking about that. Like there's all these different people that I got to talk to. And like Chris Michaels that I mentioned earlier, like always been on the cusp of working for one of the major companies 
but never got that contract? How do you want to keep going when that happens? How do you not let that defeat you? How do you come back from all these injuries that you've had and not, you know, like how do you not get in your own head about that? And it not only humanizes them, but it also lets these people know who think, man, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to talk about this because I don't feel comfortable talking about it. I don't know who I could talk to. I don't even know what to say. If they hear somebody that they may know from some different platform or somebody else out there is going through the same things, it may help them open up because complete transparency going back to, you know, my dad not being in the picture and everything else, you know, it's like, I suck at opening up. I suck at, you know, talking about what I'm feeling. I suck at all that. My wife will tell you that too. And, you know, it's just like, how do you open up and talk about it? And this was kind of like my way of doing that. And it just, uh, it ended up, you know, the biggest thing that people have said since they started listening to it is that it just feels like two friends having a conversation. And sometimes it's even with people that I've never met before we get on the screen here and, you know, do a little bit of research and then just go from there and let the conversation happen. And then they'll turn around and throw some questions my way at the end. Like, and I don't know what it is because I want to do it on the fly. But, you know, it's just having a conversation to get people's stories out there so people around the world are aware of it. And it, it still blows my mind that it's got this global audience now. May not be the biggest, but, I mean, people know what it is. And that just absolutely blows my mind. When did you start doing the podcast? I actually started back in August of uh, 2021, which, you know, again, it seems like way longer ago, but, you know, we're coming up on two years for it now. It's in its fourth season. And I, in all honesty, it just started spur of the moment because I was uh, working a first aid job that I had, uh, you know, doing a lot of like first aid and safety supplies and, you know, OSHA compliance type of stuff, you know, all the fun stuff adults do. And the customer I was at actually happened to be hosting the podcast convention. I forget what it's called, but, you know, I go there and I see Jeff Jarrett, Conrad Thompson's there. Um, Tony Schiavone and Eric Bischoff ended up being there a little bit later on. But, you know, it's like, okay, all these people are here. This is what I want to do. I don't want to be stuck in the, in the corporate world for the rest of my life. So I just literally started contemplating right there what do I have that could be different and it just became like like I mentioned earlier like letting all these people tell their stories because again a lot of these people like they may know where Randy Orton came from OVW or Brock Lesnar came from OVW but they don't know the guys that were there helping them learn the fundamentals like Chris Michaels because he had a hand in all these guys training there but he doesn't get his praises sung about that he was right there to get a contract but it just never happened so, you know, he was my first guest and I let it go from there. I had one of my friends, uh, I call her my little sister, Jennifer Silverman. She was my second guest. Uh, then, you know, Stephanie Nadolny from the Dragon Ball franchise, who was the original voice of uh, Gohan and Kid Goku for the Funimation version of Dragon Ball. She was my third guest. And it just kind of kept going from there where it was teachers, actors, wrestlers, um, entrepreneurs, authors. I've even got some coming up now with uh, different doctors and mental health specialists that talk about this stuff for ways people can, you know, get themselves out of these funks and different ways they can do it without, you know, resorting to feeling hopeless or whatever it may be. Yeah. So like, it, it just opened up a lot of doors that I really wasn't expecting, but it's it's been a fun ride and it's really just been trying to hang on. Um, at one point, I was running away from a lot of the stuff in my personal life that was happening last year. It was like one thing after the other and just burying myself in that. And I ended up working out of my favor because I've got uh, at least maybe three months worth more of guests that with interviews that haven't aired yet. So I've been able to give myself a break and recharge a little bit. Yeah. But I mean, it's just getting to talk to these people it's been an absolute blast and then it's opened the door to you know be a guest at conventions and you know do the show live there and it all it all really started off of a wrestling catchphrase so i mean you can see it on my shirt i know you hear me and you know that started back in 2011 and now here it is 12 years later still using it and i guess making it relevant but you know it's, it just it all kind of started from that 
That's so awesome that you're able to do that. And you found a, another passion that you're taking with you and it's growing, yes. you know, so for one podcaster to another, you know, any words of wisdom? <laughs> Man, just keep going and don't be afraid to give yourself a day off. That's all stuff that I, I had to learn the hard way because if you sit and think about the perfect time to do it, it there's never going to be a perfect time. Yeah. Just start when you can and do like do research, especially for the people that have been successful at it, see what they do and go from there. And then just, if you're feeling off that day and don't think you need to be doing something, give yourself a break, cut yourself some slack and just regroup the next day. Yeah. It's all about the, it's all about the hustle and the Absolutely. hard work. And I, uh, thank you very much. Of course, um, of course. So let's kind of switch gears. Let's talk about, you know, some of the charity organizations, things that you've done Absolutely. in your community. Uh Tell me about some of the, the nonprofits you've worked with. Man, okay, so like the biggest two that I work with, um, I do monthly donations to St. Jude's and to the National Humane Association. Mm. Um, I started with the Humane Association because I've always been an advocate for rescue dogs. And then my wife and I actually rescued uh, our first cat from there. She's still with us. She's nine years old this year. But, you know, like right after we got married, we adopted her. And then last year we adopted a pit bull from there who is unfortunately no longer with us, but it's just, you see all these animals that have either been mistreated or whatever the circumstances may be, and they deserve to have a home with a loving family. If I could, I would take them all in, but I don't have the space or the money for that. But I mean, it's just, they can't speak. So people have to be the advocates for them. You hear the horror stories about it. And especially with pit bulls, because mm -hmm. those are, I, I'm going to go ahead and say they're my favorite breed. Um, I've had three, all very, very loving animals, uh, got bad reps, but, you know, just that, just giving a chance for people to see that these animals, despite what you read on the internet or what you hear about a horror story that happened one time, they're loving animals. They deserve a home. They deserve to be loved. And you know, even if I can't take them all in, I can at least do something to, you know, help benefit them, help keep food there, get whatever the shelter needs. Right. So, you know, I do the monthly donations and I try to include, uh, you know, some months are better than others. If there's profit from selling merchandise like shirts or whatever, 10% of that goes to uh, the donations as well. So, I mean, it's, it, it's a big thing that I'm very passionate about because like I said, they deserve love, but they can't speak for themselves. So right. whatever I can do, because I can't take them all in, unfortunately, I will, I will do to help them. Well, that's well put, you know, uh, dogs are like man's best friend. You for know? sure. For so sure. it's, it's good to, to see, you know, people actually, you know, being active with, with doing something to improve the situation. Absolutely. And it's, it's really cool too, because I, I know Seamus, um, he, he has a house here and he's very mm -hmm. involved with the Humane Society. You see him, you know, wearing their apparel or tagging them or helping out with, you know, like, I think it's like the foster dog of the week or whatever it may be. And, you know, it, it's just a cool thing to see that he's using his status to do that and help give back. And I think he's adopted five or six dogs from there. So he's kind of oh. living the dream as far as that goes. But, yeah. you know, it's just, it's cool to see that these people with this name credibility are, are giving back to it as well. Mm -hmm. It's very heartwarming. Oh yeah. Why do you feel, I, I think you already answered this, but something I like to ask guests, you know, is why do you feel passionate about, you know, giving back? And I think it's just because it's not going to be the, the cliche that it, it feels good. It, it's more so knowing that you can make a difference in someone's life and they may not have that opportunity. They may not have had the road that I traveled or the blessings that I've had, the troubles that I've had, but they need help. And, you know, I'm, I'm a Christian. I believe that if somebody needs help, you help your fellow man. And if you have the means to do it, whether it's just donating money or, you know, buying food, whatever it may be, just doing something because ultimately they could pass it on to the next person and make someone else's life better, or you could be the person that changed their life. It's, 
it, it's as simple as that because you never know what somebody's going through or what they've been through, but you do know that you have the opportunity to help them. Yeah, I mean, it's all about making that difference and being Absolutely. a difference maker. Um, was there like a particular fundraiser that you enjoyed oh, helping man. out so, with? So this is one uh, I actually did back in November, and they're trying to get me to do it again. But with the workout routine that I'm on, I'm not going to be able to do it this month because uh, my, my my trainer is pretty strict on that. But sure. I did the uh, 3,000 push-up challenge for uh, St. Jude back in November. Mm. So that was anywhere from like 100 to 125 push-ups a day uh, nonstop. So, I mean, it's like it, my chest needs a break. I definitely saw some results from it. but. Oh, wow. You know, it, it went to a good cause. Uh, people donated to it, which was awesome. And, you know, it's just, it, it gave me a chance to do something that I enjoy doing anyway with exercising and using it as a way to help these kids and help these families that are going through things that no kids or families should really ever have to go through. I mean, it, yeah. it's just, it's just a way to give back, but have fun doing it and keep myself healthy at the same time right combining those two interests absolutely yeah i love that before we go wrap things up let's talk about um some of your cameos in wwe um oh, last right. couple of years so how'd you get the call because i know uh you were at SummerSlam last yep. year and i was i was there too i was in attendance uh, oh, tell nice. me about yeah yeah great show Great car. Tell me about that experience. So, man, it, it's so rare. It's so random, actually, because that was the first time that I'd been back since 2014. Um, hmm. Did a SmackDown appearance right after WrestleMania 30, uh, along with a Raw appearance uh, when they did the Ultimate Warrior tribute. But, um, man, this one actually came out of nowhere because it was right after uh, Pat Buck had left WWE and ended up going to AEW. And he was the guy that would book the, the local talents at that time. Well, I, it was kind of like hit or miss getting a response from him, but uh, I found out who the new guy was and just randomly shot off an email because I found out, you know, SummerSlam's coming, and this was three or four months in advance. Did not expect it, and I'm like, okay, you know, maybe he'll remember me from working some shows around this area a decade ago. We ended up, we got to talk about that later on, but he booked me, and I'm like, oh, okay, pessimist me is thinking maybe this will... Uh, this will get pulled out from under me before I actually get there or whatever. And, you know, thankfully it didn't. And, you know, I had no idea. I thought I was just going to be, be there eating catering all day or whatever it may be, but no, you know, you got to go out around the ringside, see him setting up stuff, see him going over stuff, hang out with Charles Robinson, just, uh, you know, talk to these different guys, see some guys and girls from the, uh, the nightmare factory that were up there as extras as well. And then they're like, okay, we need you three to do security for a segment. And it's like, okay. So like, that's all they said. They said it's going to be uh, after the tag team match, and that's it. So we're left alone. They give us the shirts and everything. Uh, don't really know what's going on. We go over to the gorilla position right outside of it. They say, okay, you're going to go over here and meet this guy. He's going to drive you out. So they took us out on a golf cart through the crowd, and it's just like – okay this is a uh, this is actually happening but the nerves weren't there it was like just i was in the moment i was seeing it from like a thirty thousand foot view because i could see everything in the stadium as it was happening and it's just it's just like going because i do i've done security work on on the side as well so i kind of know what to do in a legitimate situation like that but i'm also trying to worry make sure i don't block the shot and you know get in the, get in the way of the superstar mm -hmm. and thankfully i didn't i ended up front you know front row next to seth rollins which was awesome but you know it's just you know doing that producers were happy with it everybody involved was happy with it and you know i i shot a message off to that guy uh that booked me the night after and thanked him for it said hey uh i've still got my physical my blood works in check um, I'm licensed in this state. Is there any chance I could be used on any of these? And that was the Indianapolis, uh, SmackDown and the Louisville raw. And then what was supposed to be the day one pay-per-view. But, um, before I jump to that though, I just thought of something that I forgot to mention from that SummerSlam day. Um, you know, I show up, I park and there's guys like Byron Saxton, Corey Graves, uh, Chris Park, who used to be abyss. They're all, 
getting out of their cars. We're all walking in, going through the metal detectors, they're checking our bags and everything. I didn't know it, but across, uh, you know, across the way, seeing us go in, were fans that usually boo me uh, for a promotion up in Kentucky that I work for called UCW. And they're sitting there chanting my name, like in front of all these WWE people. And I'm just like, I don't think this is supposed to happen to me, but you know, here we are. It, it was a really cool experience, but you know, then flash forward, I'm sure we'll talk about, you know, SmackDown and Raw next. Cause that was the, uh, the next appearance there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, sounds like you had fun. I mean, doing oh, for it. Sure. For sure. I mean, it, the biggest thing too, that I noticed was that nobody was walking on eggshells this time. Uh, because when I went in 2014, it was almost like everybody was on eggshells. Everybody was nervous. Uh, you know, so it's just trying to stay out of the way, trying to not ruffle any feathers. And this time, man, it was just laid back as can be. Billy Kidman's, you know, hanging out in the room where the extras are because it was the producer's room as well. Michael Cole's in there. You know, like it's just all this different stuff. You know, eating lunch with Byron Saxton and Bobby Lashley. Like it's way be, more laid back this go around. What couldn't be better than that? I mean, exactly, exactly. Have you thought about? you know, working for one of the big companies? Was that and something? I've I always, that's that's the dream. And I've, I've let it be known because I've, I've submitted. I even gave Byron Saxton my resume and, you know, information like with my commercial and character demo reels, uh, links to the podcast and everything, different broadcasting and acting things I've done. I would love to go and be a manager, be a broadcaster, be something. Because I know at some point, you know, I'm going to have to slow down on the physicality, but I know that I can talk better than anything else. So put me with somebody that can't talk. That's my goal. But um, it seems like that position was a revolving door. And the person that booked me for those had, uh, had been moved to a different position. He's a producer now. And lo and behold, what was supposed to be day one in Atlanta got moved because the show got canceled. Raw was in Nashville the next day. So I asked him, hey, is there any chance that I can just get moved from that to this? Because it's in my backyard. It's like, well, I would say yes, but it's this new guy's decision. This new guy had been there before. And I kind of got blown off by it. You know, they brought in guys from different states. Uh, a lot of the same people you've seen on TV now. So I'm trying to find a way to navigate it because it's kind of like the same response every time. I even done a try out in a seminar and all this and it's just it, it's frustrating because you, you're seeing the same people some of which are my friends and it's cool but you know it's like I, I sent you 10 different dates that I could do but you're bringing the same people from here and here and here and I, I just give me another opportunity because I got fantastic reviews from everybody that I worked with the last time but it's just kind of like that momentum was pulled out from under me because people changed positions and I had no control over it. So it's it's a frustrating thing, but I would love to be in any one of these big three companies as a manager, as a mouthpiece. And if they needed somebody to be in the ring, I would love to do that too. But yeah, you know, I just, I want a job. I want the Jersey and I want to be on the team. That's, that's the main thing. You'll get there. I promise you. you, you will Thank get there. Just, it's like that songwriter trying to get his big break. You yep. will get you will get there. Just keep keep going for it and, and you'll Absolutely. make it. Thank you. You'll I appreciate it. that. Yeah. Well, listen, um, Flynn, this has been great getting to talk to you. Absolutely. Where, where, can, where can people find you on social media? Where can people find out more about your podcast and all Man, things? I'll, Flynn I'll make it easy for everybody. Um, I'm on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I've got my website. I've got my YouTube channel here soon. I'm going to have a merch, an official merch store up instead of having to go through like eBay or whatever. But I've got all links to the podcast. I've got all links to social media and my website. It's all at Linktree slash The Flynn Hendricks. Or if somebody's savvy enough and wants to go ahead and scan that QR code back there, they can do that too, and that takes you right to it. All right. Hey, uh, Flynn, this has been wonderful. Thanks again Absolutely. for coming on. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. This is Wrestling right. With Heart. I hope you found this podcast to be informative and entertaining. If you did, please hit the subscribe button and look out for the next edition.